Go back home to see my family. Action. Camera one, zoom out. Ready, camera two. Take two. Between what is hoped for and what can be, there's a bridge. Between the aspirations of a ball club and the greatest sports venue in America, there's a bridge. Between chaos and wonder, endangered and protected, there's a bridge. Built on technology that can solve, create, heal, inspire, and secure. A bridge. There from the beginning to where we stand today. And where we will go from here. One company. One promise. If you can imagine it, we will build the bridge to get you there. Cisco. The bridge to possible. Hello, and welcome to the third event in our current Women Rock IT series. Today's panel of speakers will share how technology is preserving endangered species and how fashion meets the Internet of Things to keep women safe. Being part of our live audience today does entitle you to free course enrollment into the Internet of Things, Introduction to Cybersecurity, Linux and Entrepreneurship. Details relating to course enrolment will be posted during today's event. I would like to welcome over 6,000 students registered to join us today on campus from their academy locations, virtually over Cisco TV and in person at our Cisco office in Singapore. In the interest of time, we will take questions for our guest speakers directly after the session. If you're joining us over social media, you can place your question in the chat box or you can tweet your question to hashtag WomenRockIT. Thanks and let's get started. I'd like to introduce our guest speakers today. Vicky Batka, who is our Cisco's Vice President, Partner Organization of APJC, and Aditi Chada, who is the CEO and founder of Dazzle. But first, let's hear from Vicky, who joins us today from our Cisco office in Singapore. Welcome, Vicky, and thank you for joining us. Hey, thanks, Emma, and welcome, everybody. Really excited to be here. Um, I have a little bit of a cold today, so I sound a little bit, not quite my normal chipper self, but I'm going to do my best to, to share a little bit more about me and, and, uh, and what I do for Cisco and why I love what I do for Cisco every day. Um, next slide, thanks. Um, I thought I would start today, um, this kind of seems a bit strange, but I thought I'd just, and it's always hard to talk about yourself, but I thought I'd just quickly share a little bit of my backstory. Um, I, I've been living in Singapore now for 11 years. I was in Hong Kong for two years before that, and I was born and bred and raised in Sydney, Australia. And I've been really fortunate throughout my life, and this, this particular side is kind of important to me because it captures a lot of the things that, that kind of show you who I am. Um, so born and raised in Sydney, that's me as a three-year-old with a little stuffed toy. I happened to make the local newspaper at the time. Um, you can see a lot with my family, my husband and son. We love to travel. We love being in Singapore because, it, you know, I feel like I'm raising um, a global citizen and we love to travel. I like for my son to experience and learn about new cultures from the food to the people um, to the music. You can see there, no music, no life. It's a, that's a mantra for Tower Records out of Japan. Um, also, when my parents come to visit, we like to travel together. So there's a nice shot there of the Taj Mahal when we went to India. Um, one of the things I'm going to talk a little bit about today is something else I'm passionate about. And I was very lucky a few years ago to have a trip to South Africa um, to go safari, with again, with my parents. They love to come to Singapore and we go on trips. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how technology and what Cisco are doing to help save the rhinos. Um, finally... Uh, I promise you I'm not an alcoholic, but I do like a glass of champagne. Um, I've been working for 30 years, and I do like to stop and celebrate um, when we get the opportunity. Life is short, and I think it's important to, to sometimes just stop and say thank you and be grateful. Um, so you can see I'm very happy. I was at the tennis, and I saw this big bottle of champagne. It was empty, which is why I could pick it up. 
Um, but it's always about just stopping to say um, a cheers and a thank you, I think, is important. Uh, next slide, thanks. So I have um, a 30-year-plus um, career and always in IT. Um, and I started in Australia and then over the last 20 years have expanded across Asia Pacific and Japan. Um, and some of the things that are really important to me, um, so at Cisco, we do, a, we do a personality profile. It's called our standout assessment. We've done a lot of research and we believe that when you understand people in your team and when you play to your strengths, you're even more successful. And so I'm a connector advisor. So what that means is I like connecting people together and I like advising people. I like providing input and feedback on how they could do things differently, getting people to think outside the box. And what that brings to Cisco and my team is it means that on my role as the leader of our partner organization, I'm responsible for many thousands of partners, of resellers that sell Cisco technology that don't work for Cisco. So I have to influence them every single day to teach them about the technology, but more importantly, share what's important to their customers. Personally, I love working in high-performance teams. It's been something that's really motivated me. And so working with people that I can learn from and working with people and surrounding myself with people that I can have a bit of fun with along the way, but very sales-oriented, it's always been something that has been very important to me. And I've spent a lot of time having great mentors and coaches and also doing the same, giving back, paying it forward. And so I have a lot of people that I coach and mentor, um, both in Singapore and outside of Singapore, males and females, young, old, it doesn't bother me. If people ask for help, I'm always the first one to say, how can I help? What can we do? How, how can we embrace this opportunity together? I'm very fortunate. No two days are the same for me at Cisco. Uh, last week I was in our, our headquarters in San Jose, near San Francisco. Um, the week before I was in Sydney, Australia. Um, I get to get out. I get to spend time with many diverse companies and cultures. And how we do business in each country and culture in Asia, Pacific, Japan and Greater China is very different. So how we do business in Singapore is very different to how we do business in India or Japan. And I love that. I love the fact that it's different and I can adapt my skills and I have to adapt how I show up every single day. So it keeps it really exciting for me. Uh, next slide, thanks. So that's enough about me. So one of the things I wanted to talk a little bit about today was, again, I'm influencing other people to help us sell. Uh, at the same time, Cisco as an organization, you know, we have 70,000 plus employees and we want to be global problem solvers. And we feel that there's a lot going on around us that we should take more responsibility for. We're very fortunate. The technology industry pays very well. Um, we earn good money. We earn... We, go, we get to go to great restaurants. We get to go on fabulous trips. We get to go to conferences. So how do we stop and pay it forward? What are some of the things that we could be doing? And Cisco as an organization has addresses that through a number of different ways. And firstly, we look at people and how can we influence? What can we do? How can we inspire um, society? What can we do to really think about those people that are not as fortunate as us? And then the planet. And I'm, this is important to me. I have a 10-year-old son. I want to make sure that the planet is in good shape for him and when he has kids and his kids have kids. So there's all, the, all three of these are really key to kind of thinking about what could we be doing through technology? What can we do as a, as a company, as a 70,000-person company to really support the planet? Next slide, thanks. And one of the programs in particular I'm going to touch on today, um, so there's a couple of things that we do, but this one's quite near and dear to my heart. I mentioned Africa, South Africa before. Um, I will pause just for one moment. Um, we do have um, a, a, some amazing support, um, both within our headquarters, so we do have an initiative to support homelessness and reduce homelessness in the US. But I'm very proud of the work that we're doing in countries like Australia, where we sponsor a company called Orange Sky. And what Orange Sky do is using technology. A couple of young, at the time they were early 20s, a couple of young guys decided that they wanted to make a difference and help support people that weren't as well off as some of us, that were living on the streets. And so they put washing machines into a van. They built a network in their van and they drive around and they stop in locations where people that are homeless might be staying overnight and they allow them to wash their clothes. 
And it, we take that for granted every single day. And yet it means such a big deal to these people to have their clothes washed, even if it's once a week. They then went on and put showers inside their vans. So think about it. They're living on the street. And now we've got other companies that are also supporting them through bringing in food and drinks for them, counselling, support. Um, and so this Orange Sky company is now embraced and expanded right across Asia Pacific and even in now talking about parts of the US. So my ask to you is there's always things we can do as a community and it's not always related to our day-to-day -day job or our family, but think about what you can do and let's try and make a difference. So today I want to talk about the Wildlife Conservation Program. And this was really something that we came together with one of our largest business partners, Dimension Data. And Dimension Data have been working with Cisco for over 25 years. And they were headquartered um, initially and they were founded out, out of South Africa. And together, we decided that we wanted to do something with the technology we have and a problem that we came across. And this is something that we, the program came together using technology and different roles within our organisations. And, and different roles within their organization. Next slide, thanks. Now you can see here, the vision was all about how do we stop the rhino, we started with rhinos, how do we stop rhinos being attacked, being killed, um, or being butchered for their horns? And it's quite devastating. Um, and before you know it, you know, the rhinos were very close to extinction. And so we looked at this problem with people, poachers are coming onto the properties and they would trap these animals. And so we were looking at the idea saying, well, first of all, what could we do from a security perspective? What, how could we secure the perimeter? So how do, how do we stop a poacher coming in um, into the particular property? And then we looked at, well, how can we track the animals? So we know where the animals are. So we know how we monitor them and keep them safe. And then finally, like just using technology to make sure that they can't, um, if, if someone does make it on the premises, how can we react? Now, I have to tell you, personally, I saw this um, when I was there a few years ago. Um, our guide and our tracker leapt out of the vehicle. And I'm like, where are you going? And they grabbed the gun. And like, I don't feel very comfortable because sitting in a Jeep in the middle of nowhere. And they were worried they'd found some poachers. And they said, the problem is if we find poachers, we will not um, approach them. We will not um, have any sort of confrontation because they have many weapons and they will kill people. So I was a bit shocked about that. I'm like, okay, so these guys are breaking into properties and they're going after the rhinos and then if you get in their way, they're going to come after you. So all of this problem kind of came together and we wanted to ensure that we did all this using technology but we also didn't want to leave a big footprint behind. So the environmental sustainability was very critical to this as well. So you can see here, we've actually got three different parks in South Africa. Oh, sorry, two in South Africa and one in Zambia. And we're going to talk a little bit about each of these today. But Sabi Sands is very close to the one. In fact, it's the property next door to where I went. Um, I found out later. Um, then we also have um, in Zambia, Kafu National Park as well with the elephants. So. We started off looking at the rhinos and then we quickly moved and we were challenged by, um, by the elephants. Now I have a short video to play, if you don't mind rolling the video. Cisco and Dimension Data have worked together for over 20 years. Yeah. And the, you know, Doc bringing the problem and the willingness to partner on the solution was fantastic, in particular because even just three years ago, the technology choices and the technology experiments that we used, uh, we had to learn how to, how to do this. As a partnership, we've been incredibly successful together. Statistics don't lie. They are phenomenal. The technology that you brought as a partnership together is, is nothing short of fantastic. And the goal is to hopefully create more safe havens for more animals, mm -hmm. um, which is why expanding this technology beyond this reserve and going to other reserves is so critical. It's amazing, you know, looking at this animal and realizing that this technology has actually mm -hmm. saved mm -hmm. his life. Yeah. We're definitely not finished. This is really just the beginning. And yeah. the future for us is scaling the solution and taking it to more parks and then empowering people with more sophisticated tools. It's got to be a proactive solution where we are creating a safe haven for the animals to roam freely. I'm monitoring humans. 
by monitoring humans. So good to look at, so part of Africa. We're creating a safe haven. Let's save the rhino. The rhino is just the beginning. So you can see that that's Dimension Data, one of our business partners, and then we partner with them across the um, across the globe. And you know, again, one of the things I like out of that very short clip is they talk about how they're actually monitoring the humans. So we're the ones that are doing the wrong thing here, and so we're the ones that need to be monitored and, and tracked and checked. Um, and so it's just a nice little way, a little snapshot to share with you. So if we go to the next slide, thank you. So this is Sabi Sand. If you ever get a chance to go to South Africa and go safari, save your money. It's a lot of money. It's worth the trip. It's amazing. Um, but this is what we did around the, you know, how we use technology. And, uh, you know, this is absolutely something now that we're looking to take to so many other countries around the world. So um, what we did is we set up the real-time surveillance and the perimeter security. That was the first thing we needed to make sure. Now, a lot of these parks, you can see in the, in the videos, it's quite sparse. And there's no real fences where the properties start and stop because the animals need to roam around um, and find other animals to mate with and, and go to the creek for, for their drinks and find their, find their own food. So sometimes the perimeters have to be through um, video and how we capture the video of people coming and going throughout the park. You can see here um, occasionally they'll use things like helicopters as well when they're available, not always available in this area um, to come in as well. But in this particular instance, they put up the CCTV. We were able to do that and put thermal cameras to keep track of things. If you go to the next slide, thanks. I've just got a couple of examples here for you. Um, now, forgive me, this is a hard one to describe and to explain um, and pronounce, so I'm not going to even attempt to pronounce this park name. Um, but this one is also in South Africa. And this was where we needed to work with um, a couple of different parks in this particular instance. Um, you can see here it talks about the treacherous field. So sometimes what happens is um, the, the terrain is quite difficult to get to, and so the animals get kind of locked into certain areas. And then also the criminals using pretty high-powered weapons against these poor defenseless animals as well. Um, so in this particular instance, we looked at the tagging solution, so how we track um, the, the, the animals through their horn sensors. Um, we also tracking the animals um, themselves, their whereabouts, their heart rate, their blood pressure. So if they get in distress, um, and we were able to see that and, and understand what has spooked them along the way. So honestly, if you'd asked me 10 years ago about how technology would help keep track of a rhino in a park, this would be the last thing I would think that I'd be talking about from a technology company. And I really love the fact that we've found ways and solutions to enhance the monitoring. And also what happens with a lot of these animals in Africa and South Africa is they migrate through the, through the country. So it's really important that we have ways to track um, where the animals are moving to and why as the climate changes as well. Uh, next slide, thank you. So the last example is from Zambia, a little bit more in the middle of, of the um, Africa region. And this was also um, teaming up with a different group of partners as well. So um, with Worldwide Fund um, for Nature, um, quite well known. That little panda symbol is quite well known around the world. And this time we needed to um, protect some elephants that had been poached and are still being poached. So we call it a hot spot um, when there's a certain area that we notice the population is decreasing. And this was also leveraging the technology around thermal cameras. Um, but we had to find the right place. You can't just always find the right tree. And so sometimes we've got to build masks and, and camouflage those. Um, and we needed to build up this anti-poaching command centre. Um, you know, we have to find ways. We have to have, often they, they get smart, so they'll come out at night time. So then we need to be smarter. We need to be, ensure that we're going, um, using nighttime vision, we can go and, and also try and ensure that they're not getting into the parks. Next slide, thank you. So something that I'm really proud of um, that we do at Cisco is we, we support um, things like this initiative and, and a lot of these initiatives through non-profit um, organisations and foundations. It's really important that we find the right partners to work with. It's also in, ensuring that we leverage, we have how we sell our products, you can't buy a Cisco product direct from Cisco. 
you have to go and talk to some sort of technology company. We call them a reseller or a business partner to buy our products. So we have, we have relationships with Apple, Google, um, SAP, so many large companies. So not just people that sell our technologies, but also people in the industry, in the technology industry. And so we want to continue to work together to drive all these fantastic relationships that we have to ensure that we can go back to these nonprofits as a community and help provide back um, great solutions. You can see here, everybody knows Leonardo DiCaprio, right? He's out there doing some amazing things. So why not go and talk to someone like that and offer um, the technology to help bring a solution to life? I'll talk about National Geographic a little bit more towards the end because we have partnered with them a lot about this particular scenario. Um, next slide, thank you. I just have a couple more slides. So um, the, the thing about how we approach conservation is it has to be multifaceted. Cisco can't do this on our own. And we have to focus on ensuring the local people and communities are also uh, willing and are also in, embracing the support that we bring to them. And so it's about this multi-geography. It doesn't matter what country we're in. We can still make a difference. It doesn't matter what type of technology we have. We can bring it together. And so it really is that multifaceted um, approach. One more slide, thank you. So we create these co-innovation centres. Um, and that's really a way that we can work together um, and ensure that we find what is good for the world. You can see down the bottom a great quote from our CEO. It has to be about what's good for the world and what's good for business because we're all so connected now. And we work with a number of different um, organisations, including the UN, and we have very spe specific sustainability goals that we've created because that also leaving a limited footprint behind. It's very difficult to leave no footprint behind, but we want to reduce the digital footprint. So these are just some of the things, some of the ways that we're approaching uh, what we do every day. Now I have one last slide, if you don't mind. And I've talked a lot about the rhinos. So what we did is we've partnered um, with National Geographic and they've actually created a documentary. It will be shown, you can see the dates there down the bottom in, in Australia and New Zealand. It's going to be in London. I haven't got a date for Singapore just yet. Um, it's a fantastic video. It's, it includes some of our Cisco staff. It includes some of our business partners you just saw on the clip before. And we have one more clip to show you if that's okay as we round out today's session from me. Thank you. Roll the video, thanks. The field rangers reported two shots. It's four guys. They're going after a rhino. You know they're armed. Rhino horn is the most expensive commodity on the black market. If the interior... <laughs> this is Arthur the Brave. Arthur's mom has been brutally killed. I want to go and find out who did it, why they did it. What drives a person to kill such a beautiful animal? To have such a war on an animal really took everyone by surprise. It's not just conservation anymore, it's a crisis. Runners being hit every eight hours. Things continue the way they're going, but 2025 we will have no rhino left. It's a premeditated crime, it's a lot of blood. You have to have a whole network. Ten carcasses in a 200 metre radius. People's lives are not being put on the line because of greed. I've been fortunate enough to be able to drive technology to conserve species. As soon as something happens, we pick it up immediately. This is some hardcore technology standing in the middle of the bush. Usually it's looking for the animals. But in this case, we're looking for the people that are going after the animals. The power of this is enabling people. Our grandchildren must know this is a rhino, this is a leopard, this is a, a lion. It's in our hands. I wouldn't want my grandchildren asking me, what did you do, Grandpa? Mm. Why didn't you send the rhino? Thank you. Oh, great, Vicky, and thank you so much for joining, sharing your journey with us today and really demonstrating the partnerships that really are making an impact. Thank you. Um, we're going to hold questions for Vicky and we're going to move on to our next 
guest speaker. I would like to now introduce Aditi Chada, who is the founder and CEO of Dazzle, and she is joining us today from our Cisco office in New Delhi. Welcome, Aditi, and thanks for joining us. Hi. Um, very nice to be here. That story about the rhino was so touching. I'm a little emotional now. Uh, but uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity. I am right now in uh, Gurgaon, next to New Delhi, and I'm going to be talking about how the Internet of Things uh, can be uh, can uh, be leveraged to keep women safe around the world. Okay. Next slide. Next slide. Yes, next slide. Okay. So I'll tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, I uh, studied I till high school. I was uh, in India. I grew up in New Delhi. Thereafter, I moved to uh, the UK to study for my undergrad degree in, um, in business studies. Then I moved to the US uh, in my second year to the University of Richmond, where I studied accounting and finance. After that, I, uh, you see my graduation picture with my mom, uh, <laughs> proud mama there. Uh, then I worked in New York City at Deloitte & Touche. Uh, that's the World Financial Center uh, in New York City. Um, and uh, and uh, you know, after that, I uh, did my uh, master's in financial analysis uh, from the University of San Francisco. I moved to the West Coast. So from New York, I moved to uh, San Francisco. Um, and then I worked in mergers and acquisitions advisory at Grant Thornton. Uh, so that's a little bit about my educational background. Very, you know, business studies, accounting, finance oriented. As you can see, uh, yeah, I, I mentioned my degrees here. I, um, I took the CFA exam. I passed level two. Um, I uh, got my uh, CPA license uh, from California. And so very number oriented kind of background of study. Next slide. Okay. So I want to talk about, you know, talking about women's safety. Uh, I'm going to talk about why I started working on this project. But let's talk about the problem, what prompted me. Uh, so when I was living in San Francisco, I would hear a lot of news about the problem of women's safety around the world, but even more so uh, in India. Um, and then I started researching the statistics, and I, and, I, and I read that one in three women experience some sort of physical or sexual violence uh, in their lifetime. Uh, according to the United Nations, 35% of women face assault at least once. And, you know, it's something that's happening uh, across, uh, you know, financial classes, across uh, different communities. It's not relegated to just, you know, a poor or rich. It's, it's happening all around the world, and uh, it's happening in different uh, communities. Um, and, uh, you know, it's just something that's not talked about as much because there's a lot of shame, there's a lot of guilt involved. Sometimes women don't get the support of families, uh, you know, and stuff like that uh, to uh, get to seek help. And, uh, you know, when I started researching this more, I, I realized that I wanted to work on addressing this problem and not just be a bystander and talk about it on Facebook. Hey, this is something that's so bad that's happening. So I started, uh, I started to take action on this. Next slide. Okay. Now the problem that I faced was that you know I had I, I was coming from an accounting and finance background. It's, it was all about debits and credits and expected returns, uh, and you know risk of uh, uh, investments and expected returns, etc. But um, you know so that came as a challenge because I now had to move from the world of accounting and finance to. Uh, technology, uh, and I, uh, you know, I, I addressed the problem of women's safety using electronics built with Bluetooth technology. It was such a big jump to move from, uh, you know, one industry to another. Next slide. And to me, it felt like a skydive. I remember I'd done skydiving in New Jersey, and it was really as challenging, risky, and scary as doing a skydiving, changing industry, moving from accounting and finance from that world to the world of electronics and technology. But you know what? I realized that I wanted to work on this problem, and you and I realized that I have to take action because uh, that became my mission to work on this problem. And I'm like, I have one life. Either I can do it, uh, you know, because I'm going to learn how to do this, or I cannot do it because, uh, you know, I can just make the excuse that, no, this is not my background, so I don't want to work on it. And you know what I chose? I chose to take the risk. I chose to skydive. Next slide. And that's how Dazzle was born. So Dazzle's motto is be safe, be confident, and Dazzle. Next slide. Okay. So uh, we started with our prototyping process. Uh, you know, I had to learn about uh, technology. I had to learn about Bluetooth technology. I had to learn about 
what kind of product I was going to make, make. I became the chief product officer of my company that I founded, uh, that is Dazzle. And uh, we started the prototyping. Uh, oh, and I attended a lot of conferences, you know, sought out mentors uh, uh, and, uh, you know, learned about how this thing was done because I could guide my engineers on what to build, how to build, write down formulas, algorithms of how my app would work, of how my IoT product would work. Um, and we started the prototyping process in India, and then we finalized a product with our engineers uh, and industrial designers in Malaysia. So that is uh, my, you know, favorite uh, uh, person from my contract manufacturer in Malaysia. His name is Johnny, and he's an amazing, amazing person. Uh, that's the whole team there uh, in Malaysia. As you can see, I, you know, this is me working with them, work, coming up with the final product. Uh, next slide. But, you know, the thing is that, you know, when you... Uh, when I approached these contract manufacturing partners and my advisor had advice that I should meet with them, um, you know, uh, this is a different culture, right? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm coming from Silicon Valley, uh, San Francisco. Now, I, I, I actually, for Dazzle, I'd moved to India. Now I'm going to Malaysia to work with people. You know, there's so many different cultures to traverse, you know, different working culture in America, different culture in India, different culture in, in Malaysia. And what is so important to know is that before you start any working relationship across different cultures, uh, you know, you have to be very adaptable and flexible and understand how they work. You have to build trust. First, you build trust. Then it's easier to work together because you understand each other. And how we did that? We actually did that. Uh, you know, we went for uh, whining and dining. And in Malaysian culture, uh, you know, it's cultural practice to actually uh, get to know each other first before you do business. So we built trust over dinner, over wine. And I remember I had severe allergies when I went to Malaysia. Uh, you know, there was some uh, dust particles that time from crop burning in Indonesia that were flowing over Malaysia, and I got severe allergies. But I was just there for a couple of days and I had to make the best of it. So I took my paper napkins and, you know, I, I had my medicines and there I went. You know, I had the wine, I had the food and I focused on getting to know them and for them to get to know me and to understand the passion I had for this product and to understand the severity of the problem of women's safety because everybody has women in their families. So we could all be on the same page and work together in a united manner. Um, and that really worked because these are very big contract manufacturing partners. These are very reputed people in the industry. And it was very important for me to win their trust. And fortunately, I was able to win their trust. And uh, that was wonderful because, you know, we built an incredible product together. Next slide. Okay. Um, you know, uh, as a chief product officer, uh, I had to learn, you know, now coming from an accounting and finance background, going to technology, leading a team of engineers in India, in Malaysia, working with people in China, uh, you know, I had to learn the engineering possibilities and limitations of Dazzle, uh, because for me to tell my engineers what to work on, how to do it, uh, I needed to first understand the product myself, you know. The form factor of the product. So uh, I have, uh, you know, Dazzle in front of me. Uh, you know, as you can see, there's a metal body and there's, a pl you know, outside the accessory. And then, uh, you know, there's a plastic a polycarbonate body inside. You know, where should the plastic be? Where should the metal be? Because there's Bluetooth inside this and that interferes with metal. So where should the antenna be placed so that it doesn't interfere? We had to really calibrate this. We had to really iterate. We had to really understand all of this. We had around 10 versions of, uh, you know, prototypes before we came to the, to the design for manufacture, that is DFM, the final version of the product. Then again, you know, how long should the Bluetooth range be? For us, it was around 100 feet line of sight. But the longer the Bluetooth range, that's negative for the battery life. And vice versa. So what is the perfect Bluetooth range versus the battery life of the product? Because you don't want it to run out of battery fast, right? You want our product has a 45 day battery life, uh, you know, uh, on a single charge. How often should the GPS readings be taken per hour? Because the more GPS readings are taken, the more battery life is used, right? The more data is used. How often should it, should it be taken? How often should it be pushed to the cloud? Again, it affects the battery life. Uh, so those kind of things had to be, uh, you know, taken care of metals, antenna placement, uh, Bluetooth range, GPS readings per hour, how often you push the data to the cloud. All of that has to be understood properly. Next slide. So from the previous image, you saw how Dazzle looked, and this is the final version, as I'm also showing you here. So we have an application on the phone, and we have, you know, the, the hardware product here. Um, 
and it works at the click of a button. So there's a, you know, it's, it's flat from the back. It's very beautiful, actually. You know, you, you can't really see the button, but it's actually there. It's like a secret button here. And, uh, you know, in an emergency uh, situation, uh, you know, you'd, you'd click on that button and it's going to, uh, you know, leverage, uh, it's going to actually uh, kickstart, uh, uh, you know, uh, the Dazzle application on the phone. Um, so uh, this is, yeah, so this is, um, you know, this is the app. Uh, you know, and I'm going to do stop SOS because right now I'm not in an emergency. I'm in the Cisco room. Uh, so these are connected devices for women's safety, confidence, and peace of mind. It comes in the form of a keychain. You can attach it to a handbag. You can attach it to your clothing. You can put it in your pocket. Uh, and, you know, you can have it in the nice ac accessory that you have, the silver and the rose gold, or you can have it just as plastic polycarbonate. And at, at the bottom, you can see that little uh, rubber thing. That's where the charging unit is. You know, you can uh, charge it with a micro USB. That is the Android charger. Okay, next slide. Yeah, um, and I, uh, you know, I uh, use this product a lot, of course, for safety too. And there's some additional features that I'm going to tell you about uh, that will come up. But uh, as you can see, I've attached it to my handbag, uh, my keychain. That's me doing a presentation. Next slide. Okay, uh, you know why I built it in the form of something uh, more trendy? was because I saw the existing variables in the market. And I'm like, you know, women are multifaceted people. We are very, you know, we, women are smart. Women are, you know, they are uh, fashionable, smart, trendy. Uh, they're doing so many things at the same time. And I felt that women require a multifaceted solution. And existing variables that I saw in the market uh, were not focusing on women's unique needs. Um, and, you know, safety being one special unique need. And the existing variables that I saw in the market, they were very bulky and unstylish. And I wanted to make something that women, uh, you know, that would also be cool and that would not just come across as a, you know, emergency safety device, but something that's also trendy, multifaceted, and also takes care of safety. Next slide. Yeah, so Dazzle is for the women in your lives. You know, when a woman is moving to a new city for work, for university, uh, for the peace of mind, for the families, for the parents, for the spouses, uh, you know, when women are traveling on business or for, uh, or for personal reasons, uh, Dazzle can be used in all those situations uh, to help a woman uh, seek safety in a more uh, robust manner and efficient manner. Next slide. Okay, now we're gonna play the video for Dazzle. Uh, please play the video. This is Dazzle, a connected device designed to empower women and keep them safe. Should you ever feel uncomfortable with your surroundings, at the press of a button, you can send an alert to your family or friends with your location, alerting them of your situation and enabling them to help. You can also choose to sound an alarm in situations where you feel threatened, enabling you to take control and act with confidence in the moment. Dazzle is for all those women embarking on a new journey in their lives, becoming independent. Whether it's going to university, starting a new job, moving to a new city, or simply traveling. Here's how it works. Dazzle is small and elegant, enabling you to attach it to your keychain, handbag, or clothing, or simply put it in your pocket. For emergency alerts or SOS situations, it's easy. Press and hold the button on your Dazzle for three seconds to send a text with your location. This can be sent to one person or to many people within your safety network. In your day-to-day -day life, you can use Dazzle to let someone know you've reached your destination safely. By clicking it once, it will send a text to a chosen loved one or significant other, letting them rest easy knowing you've arrived safe. Dazzle also helps you find lost things with its unique separation alert system. Can't find your keys? Can't find your phone? Dazzle can help with that too. Want peace of mind? Take control and Dazzle. Next slide. Okay. So it has a location-based alert system. So like I shared with you, you click the button if you're in an emergency and you cannot, you know, immediately access your phone. Um, at that point, you press the button and your location goes to people that you want, you know, in your app. You can select that if I'm ever in any sort of trouble, I want these people to know where I am. So they would get their SOS alert. You can set up their uh, telephone numbers. So they'll get it through the app if they have the app or they'll get it through SMS. Um, 
So you send your alert to your trusted network with your location. Uh, you can, if you want, you can also sound an alarm. It's up to 85 dB loud. Uh, and you can uh, sound an alarm, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, that uh, that is an option that you have. Uh, or uh, you can, uh, because, yeah, because, you know, you might not have, your phone might be in your handbag. It might not be immediately accessible. So this could be a more efficient and robust manner to access safety. Next slide. And the secondary functionality is that it also acts as a lock, lost item tracker. So if you cannot find your key, you know, you can attach it to your keychain. So on your phone, there's a button, button um, on your phone. If you can see uh, my phone here, if I launch the Dazzle app, uh, you know, there's a button here and I can say find device. And, you know, I don't know if you can hear it, but it starts sounding. Or if you can't find your phone, uh, you know, you can click it uh, twice, uh, which is something that I do. And my phone will start ringing. And I use this a lot to find my phone because even in my handbag, I can't find my phone many times. It's like, you know, hiding somewhere. Um, you know, if you, you can also, uh, you can also set it up to uh, receive urgent notifications. So you, you can say that if certain people are calling you or texting you or emailing you, uh, you can also, uh, you know, get a notification on your, uh, on your Dazzle device that, you know, my mom has called me or my husband has called me, etc. Next slide. Okay, next slide. So that's the packaging. Next slide. Yeah, so those were things like I told you, maximum range is 100 feet line of sight. Um, and there's a rechargeable battery that you can charge using your, you know, like the Android device charger, like a micro USB. It has a 45 day standby time and it's a very light device. You know, it has an, uh, uh, has an anti-hacking me mechanism in place. Uh, so your phone or the device cannot be hacked. Uh, and it allows for over-the-air firmware upgrades. So when we want to upgrade it, we can just upgrade your app and wirelessly over Bluetooth, it will update your device also if you want to, you know, update some functionality on the device. Device meaning the, uh, the Dazzle device. Uh, next slide. Those are some technical specifications. Next slide. Yes, and you know what? I cannot even begin to tell you how many pitches I've made to corporates, um, investors, uh, you know, uh, audiences around the world. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, it, it doesn't, you know, we, we did end up raising some funds and some investment as uh, in the next slide. But you just have to be persistent. You keep on going on. It's not that, you know, the first or second time you do it and you expect immediate results, you know, because you want people to back you up. You're looking for people to uh, invest in you, to fund you, uh, to work with you. And so next slide. Uh, you know, I had to make a lot of business proposals, uh, pitches, and, you know, we were able to raise some funding and some investment from SOS Ventures of Europe. We got into a very highly ranked uh, uh, hardware technology accelerator called Hacks in San Francisco. Uh, then, you know, Vodafone also backed us, the government of India backed us. Next slide. We got a lot of, uh, you know, a press, uh, media attention, uh, and that was great. You know, we also, I spoke about it also at, uh, you know, United Nations Development Program organized, uh, you know, in, investing for good in Asia and co-sponsored by Financial Times. And I also spoke there about Dazzle, so that was a great opportunity. Uh, next slide. So what I want to say is that, uh, you know, the learning for me through Dazzle, Dazzle has been like a mom to me. It's been like a new birth to me because I learned so much from running this company uh, and it built on my skills that I had gained from my jobs. Uh, you know, because I was coming from a different background in accounting and finance and I learned so much about technology that today when I'm, you know, getting this beautiful opportunity by Cisco to talk about it. Uh, you know, it is your responsibility to curate your world. When you see opportunities, you want to solve a problem. I would encourage that don't let your existing background or your past background to come in the way. You know, you can, you don't have to learn 100%. There's some important things that you need to learn. It's called the Pareto principle. 80% you learn, and then you can hire people. You can, you know, reach out to mentors. You attend conferences. There's so much information online. There's so many books out there. You learn that, you know, and you solve the uh, problem that you want to solve. You uh, address the opportunity that is in front of you. And I want you to, I want to encourage you to, uh, you know, think out of the box, to not let obstacles come in the way of, I've not studied this, I've not studied that, I've not worked in that. Uh, 
you know you can launch startups nowadays uh, in a new industry and like i said there's way to learn there's ways to learn the new skills the path is waiting for you you are going to write your story don't let your background come in the way learn the new skills address the new opportunities carve it for yourself are you going to go right or left only you will decide it so thank you very much from india thank you thank you aditi what a great product and you know fantastic to see that you've got that um anti hacking mechanism that's really really important especially when we're talking about iot and everything being so connected so thanks again for sharing your journey today um a great product fantastic gift i think i might want to get one after today's event um right i want to move over to questions now so what we might do is take questions from our tp rooms and then we'll cross over to our social media channels so i think uh vicky if we go back to your room we might see if uh, the students in our singapore room have any questions hi they're sitting behind me so pardon me as i pivot anybody got any questions for vicky or myself please please any stereotypes or rumors i can oh so i don't know if you guys can hear that So the question no, was um do we face any stereotypes um in in the industry and in IT? Yes, absolutely. Um I've been doing this a long time. The population of women in technology companies is quite small. And so it, that's been tough over the years. Um for me, I'm the type of person where I embrace opportunity. So um I don't let it stop me. I don't let I don't want it to hold me back and I try to even with the teams that I manage so I manage a very large team now for Cisco I try very hard to treat everyone as an equal and to treat my my parents always taught me treat someone how you want to be treated and so that's important to me and if I can live by those sort of values and principles then I hope that that will come back to me um we're very fortunate that we Emma companies like Cisco we have um amazing people I think it's our people and our network of people and community that um if people misbehaved or were treating people unfairly or disrespectfully we would deal with that um so but yes it's it's there i mean i've worked for quite a few companies over the 30 years and um unfortunately that but i learned from that i always look at people um how they've treated me and i say if they've treated me badly i don't want to ha that have that experience ever happen to me again so what can i learn from that and how can i ensure that i understand that and internalize that and not treat anyone that way Good question. Thank you. That's great. And I think we could probably um ask that same question of Aditi. Um how, how have you felt? You know, uh running a startup as a woman founder and that too in hardware technology, uh there's not many women like uh, uh like Vicky said in technology, let alone hardware technology, right? IoT and stuff like that. But like I said, when you have a mission in mind, right? are you going to let all those obstacles like your prior background or uh you know i studied this i studied that i worked in this field or that field or you know i'm a woman you cannot let that come in the way you have to work a little harder and i definitely uh have seen that and i have also done that i have faced patriarchy for sure because there's been many times where i've gone to pitches to corporates um you know and uh, investors and not just in india but also in the us and in other parts of the world and i'm asked questions like you know bring your you know someone who can answer the technical questions but without even asking me uh, whether i can answer technical questions it was assumed bring someone who can answer the technical questions at that point i had to work extra hard and learn the engineering possibilities and limitations of my product and i tell them you know what i'm going to be answering that because i am the product officer i uh, build this product with my engineers so i'm well versed in that um So yes you have to have ready answers you have to put in a little bit extra hard work and i think uh, i think we women can do that right we can put in a little bit extra hard work that's okay <laughs> thanks to dt okay we might just um any more questions from your room vicky so sure, just one second we got one more how do you handle like international um people they all give and how do you uh, bring all of your work together yeah so um the question is um how do i how do we handle international and and different people in different countries i guess and then how do we bring it together um i guess again if you think about if you treat people how you like to be treated you need to be respectful um i was very lucky the first time i went to japan i had a fantastic colleague that joined me and 
helped me understand. So in Japan, so it's very natural for us in Singapore to have our mobile phones with us all the time. You go on the public transport, um, you get in the lift or in the Uber or in the Grab, doesn't matter, we're always on our phones. In Japan, it's very rude to use your phone in a lift or in a public space. It's very rude to talk too loudly. Um, and so often I've learned from other people helping me and guiding me, and I think that that's made a huge difference um, to navigate. Even coming from Hong Kong to Singapore, I was like, oh, it'll be very similar. There wasn't. There were a lot of things that were quite different. So I think having a good network of people that I could go to and talk to made a big difference. Um, Emma, back to you. Yeah, no, that's great. Um, again, we could probably ask Aditi the same question, given the fact that you're, you know, you've worked across borders as well. Would you like to sort of answer that? Yeah. Um, you know, I think I also touched upon this briefly uh, in my presentation. So what I, I, I'll expand on that. The thing is that, um, you know, when you are working with people and you're depending on their work, right? Like for me, I was working with my engineers in uh, Malaysia. Uh, trust uh, is extremely important to build and to show extreme respect for their culture. Uh, you know, we cannot, uh, if, you, if you want them to be motivated by you, to be working, they're doing the best for you, uh, to really, uh, and you want them to, you know, believe in what you're doing. Uh, it's very important. Uh, I'm actually going to backtrack. It's very important for you to win their trust for the, and to buy the, to buy their belief in what you're doing, you know, so they can support you wholeheartedly and to respect the culture. Uh, whether I go to America, I have to follow the culture there. If I'm in India, I respect the culture here. If I go to Malaysia, I'm going to respect the culture there. I was in Germany, Singapore. You know, we have to be very, very adaptable. The benefit we have is that nowadays we work in international teams. And we have to understand what matters to them, what's their culture, and also get to know a little bit about them. At least in my case, I, uh, you know, got to know a little bit about, about the families, educational background of the partners I was working in Malaysia or in China. And I, I understood what matters to them. And that way I could also adjust how I talk to them, you know. Uh, the empathy is very, very important to have empathy and respect for who they are. Uh, and I think then they feel even they feel even uh, to work, uh, you know, they feel like working even harder for you. And that's something I've seen. And I'm really happy that I've had that learning. Thanks, Aditi. And I think that goes a little bit back to the trust um, you touched on previously. OK, I'm going to throw it back at Vicky. Um, this is a virtual question. We've got a couple that's coming in. Um, the first one is by getting behind these initiatives, Cisco is showing that they are a company that does good in the world. Um, how important is this to employees? Wow. Um, actually, in the videos, we had some of our Cisco employees. Um, they were so passionate. They volunteered their time. We give all our staff, 70,000 people, we get 50 hours a year to donate to some, to, to go and work in some sort of, and support some sort of charity. In Singapore, sometimes it's um, a local charity. Might go pack some food boxes, um, do some bread deliveries. Um, in other countries, we'll go, um, we'll go into a country and we'll build a house um, in Cambodia, something like that. So there's a lot that we do, and our employees really embrace that because they see that they can. There's no risk to the to the employee because you're given the time off anyway. If you don't use that time, you don't get paid for it. Um, like it's 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 not an additional benefit. It's just available time. So there's no downside to you. It doesn't impact your day to day salary. Um, so we, we try to encourage people to go and spend the time. And 50 hours that's one week. One week to give up to go support someone is really not a lot of time. And so our employees really embrace that. And it does. Um, it really contributes towards um, a recent award that we won, which was great place to work in Asia. Came second. And. These are the things that people enjoy. They're not coming to work to do their job. They're coming to work to use fantastic technology, to work with great people. But they're coming to work for a company that gives back. It's really important. In every country, we do something different. So it's not like our corporate are saying, this must be the way. We're very flexible, and we can do that, and we can vary that across the different regions to what's appropriate for the local market. Great. Fantastic. And I've got another one for you, Vicky, just while we're on the topic of, um, well, on your room, I suppose. Um, it's evident that Connected Conservation was, is all about partnerships to solve business problems and not one organisation can do it alone. Does this ring true in business as well? Yes. Yeah, it does, actually. 
Um, so I, I look at the connected com- conservation. I don't look at it quite so much as a business issue. I, I look at it as it's a it's a community problem that we have. Um, it's a global problem. It's something that impacts all of us. Um, when we go to market, how you buy Cisco products, as an example, you don't buy just Cisco products and that's it. You, we sell a solution, and within that solution are other technologies. So part of what I manage and part of what I do every day is I manage a community of ecosystem partners, which is another three or 4,000 partners across the globe. That's where we work with Apple. So on our phones, we have um, engineering um, technology with Apple built into the security of our phone, built into how we access the video technology like what we're doing today. And it's all about how we can simplistically use a device. Um, that's a very different relationship. And a customer, a consumer, all of us have our, our, our Apple phones. We would never know that that technology is even there. And as a business user, I may not even know that I'm us- utilising some sort of technology. So it does happen in business all the time. Fantastic. Okay, I've got another one for Aditi um, that's just gone through. Um, You've got a product line that's all about IoT. Where do you think you'll take your product next? Will you introduce new technologies? And is there anything that you do relating to data? Um, So, uh, you know, the data that is uh, collected anonymously is, uh, you know, about the locations. Because uh, the because the product also has a community uh, you know angle to it, so there's uh, you know we have like a uh, you know dazzle community within three kilometers. So within three kilometers, so one of the things is that uh, and and we'll see you know where that goes. But one of the things is that you know you can have your immediate family members or you know friends to get your emergency uh, location. But let's say that they are not in a particular area, could the community be leveraged, you know, like a good Samaritan community? Because not in, 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 like in many countries, like even in India, there's not like a one central emergency response system, like you have 911 in US. So until that's there, can community kind of step up? And that would be something interesting to see, you know, not only uh, for Dazzle, but how other companies also take advantage of the power of the community, you know? Because, uh, you know, people might not necessarily be comfortable going to an emergency scene, but could they also call the cops, you know? Could uh, could they take some sort of action? Uh, you know, maybe there's a fire. Could could the community take action and step up? Uh, you know, in, the, in terms of IOD, uh, where things are headed is, I recently wrote uh, an article about this that was published uh, two days back. Um, you know, um, IOD uh, is, in, in addition to, in consumer devices, we are seeing little less application of IOD now. But we're seeing a lot more IoT coming up in industrial uh, in industrial uh, settings. So, for example, supply chains of companies have been set up with IoT, where you can track, you know, the product every minute where it's going, or you know, there could be a certain temperature sensitive stuff in the product. So, is it you know hot there? Is it cold there? Does the temperature need to be adjusted? Or in malls, uh, you know, shopping complexes, offices, you know, if there's no people, can we shut off the AC? Uh, or you know, it's uh, or if you know, or can we turn on? a turn on the AC because there's a lot of people. Can these things be adjusted, you know, with certain thermal sensors um, and stuff like that? And then um, we've kind of seen that in, you know, think uh, like let's say you're going to a restaurant and, uh, you know, you, let's say in the future they could be handing you uh, like a, uh, you know, like like an iPad kind of device uh, where, uh, you know, your, your, uh, it can recognize your face and it knows what kind of stuff you ordered in the past. And like a Netflix recommendation, it can recommend that you might like to eat this today or that today. And maybe from your voice, it can judge what kind of mood you're in. So today you're in the mood for chocolate or you're in the mood for something savory. So those kind of things are all being worked on and it's going to be super exciting, you know? Yeah. Wow. Sounds exciting. Except for the chocolate. Yeah. Um, <laughs> okay. One last question, um, which has come off our social media feed uh, for Vicky. It's from Karina Latham, and Karina is asking, how do you overcome barriers working in a male-dominated industry? Um, this is where your coach or sponsor can be really helpful. So I think sometimes um, having someone you can talk to about situations and explaining this, how you feel about that situation um, or your manager and being able to kind of talk through different ways to approach things. Um, you know, when I started out, it was you had to – I'm not one of the boys. 
you, you know, you don't have to be one of the boys. I wanted to be different. I wanted to be me. I'm very, um, it's, it's very important to me to be authentic to who I am. Um, I'm naturally bright and bubbly, it's, except for today with my cold. But usually that's, that's who I am. And I, I, I don't have a poker face. I'm terrible in Las Vegas because I, I wear my heart on my sleeve. If I'm upset, if I'm angry, if I'm stressed, you will see it on my face. But I have to say, since I've been at Cisco, I'm always happy, which is great. <laughs> and so I think, I think sometimes it's it's tough, and you need to have someone to talk through when you feel uncomfortable, when you find something a challenge. I had a fantastic manager when I was 25, and he told me to stop and listen. He didn't quite say it in that in that way, um, but I think he taught me to understand that as a male, all he saw was me wanting to get my point across and wanting to talk, talk, talk. And I was used to that because I was from a large family. That's how we sat around our dinner table at night time. And so I think what he taught me to do is say how a female sees me and how a male sees me is quite different. And you have to be you have to be a bit more conscious about what's going on around you. And we talk a lot about EQ and IQ. It's great to be really smart and have a high IQ, but you need to be conscious of what's around you. And that EQ is that it's it's really understanding people's feelings and their contributions. So. It's really important sometimes if you do feel uncomfortable about a situation or a challenge to have a conversation with someone, have a discussion and talk it out, male or female. You'd be surprised. People want to help you. And I always, I guess the way I always approach it was I'm one of four children and three of us are girls. And so my dad had four, you know, three girls, four kids. You know, he always wanted to understand from a female perspective. So the males around you, they had a mother. They've got a wife most of the time. Or maybe they've got a girlfriend. Um, so you just got to get them to stop and think about their behavior. And don't be afraid to call them out on it sometimes either. Hey, that's not appropriate. That's quite rude. You're offending me. That's okay. Um, because sometimes they just don't realize how, how their behavior is coming across. Yeah, that's a great point. Thank you so much, Vicky. And thank you, Aditi, as well. I really appreciate your time today. Um, it was great having you both here and sharing your journey. So again, thank you. And that's all we have time for today. All presentations and recordings will be made available after the event. You'll find them on our uh, Women Rock IT website. Um, as a reminder, being part of our live audience today does entitle you to four of our Cisco Networking Academy courses. We have Yay. posted the link during today's event. Make sure you look out for that. And we look forward to you joining our next event on Thursday, the 23rd of May, where we'll learn how technology is helping crisis-affected populations and how technology is saving babies in rural and remote areas. We hope you can join us. Thanks and have a great day.